Well, good morning. I'm glad to see everybody today. This is uh, July 19th, 2020. Day 200 uh, or 500 or 800 of the quarantine. Uh, you know, if you ever wanted to know exactly what eternity felt like, we've kind of had it here lately with this quarantine. So that's my point of view. Uh, the, the lesson is... How should I respond to politics? Now, I don't mind telling you this is kind of an uncomfortable subject. I've tried very hard not to get real political in, in uh, the lessons today, but uh, that's, they outright called me out. So here we are. The point of this is to reflect Christ in how you interact with politics and government. So we'll, uh, we'll work on that, work our way through it. Uh, the passage is Romans 13, 1 through 10. And uh, we start with a story. Uh, politics can be a real minefield, especially for Christians. I learned this when I served on my local school board. While politicians are often concerned about the outcome, Christians also must be concerned about the process. In one contentious moment, some of my colleagues wanted to accomplish a goal that would have been good. But they wanted to get there in a way that violated uh, Christian principles. I couldn't support something good if I had to gr agree to an unbiblical path. The phrase, the end justifies the means, is often associated with 16th century philosopher Machiavelli. He wrote in one of his works, For although the act condemns the doer, the end may justify him. It's a little bit... Uh, out there, it sounds like to me. Machiavelli apparently believed that if our goal is good, then we are free to use whatever means we need to achieve it. Unfortunately, many Christians today seem to embrace the philosophy, but you won't find that idea in Scripture. In fact, God calls us to a wholly different standard, a standard of obedience and love that will be seen in how we respond to politics and the government. Now, to set this up, we have, uh, <clears throat> after explaining the theology of the gospel of Christ and addressing the issue of Israel's rejection of the gospel, Paul wrote of the practical implications of the gospel for the lives of the believers. One of the implications was how the gospel should, be, should affect a believer's view and relationship to governing authorities. The topic was particularly appropriate for the believers in Rome who were living in the heart of the Roman Empire. And they go to your first question of the day is, uh, what do you recall about your first experiences with an election? Were you excited? Uh, were you kind of intimidated? I myself was kind of excited because uh, it was a it was a presidential election and and it was uh, something I had never done before. So you know, it meant a lot. I started watching a little bit more of the politics involved. So I thought it was uh, was really good. I, I try not to miss a vote on anything. So because you don't vote, you can't fuss about it. So that's what my dad always told me. Okay, we'll go to Romans 13, 1 through 4. <clears throat> Let everyone submit to the governing authorities, since there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are instituted by God. So then, the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command, and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are uh, not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have its approval. For it's God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it does not carry the sword for no reason. For it is God's servant uh, and avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. So, looks like to me they're telling you God will take care of it if we have a bad source. God will uh, weed it out. Uh, so if you imagine life in the Roman Empire was relatively peaceful and pleasant, prosperous, 
think again. The truth is, slavery, sexual ex exploitation, violence, cruelty, graft, and I had to look up graft. Uh, graft is uh, making money illegally. So, and corruption were common in the first century. It was in the midst of all this that Paul wrote to admonish Roman believers, let everyone submit to governing authorities. I know in this day and age with this uh, quarantine thing going on, it's, it's difficult to uh, understand the idea of submitting to the authorities. I know I have a, an issue with uh, the whole mask thing. so. But I do it because I've been asked to most of the time. I'd never heard the phrase rule of law until I heard it used on the news during the 1990s. The phrase is a reminder that every society must have some form of governance that guides the people and processes so we can live in peace. Although the idea of the rule of law wasn't invented until the 90s, in the 90s, it's at least as old as this ancient text. We go to two questions. Uh, have you seen, how have you seen government benefit you or your community? Well, I look at the parks, uh, the beach that we've got downtown. Uh, they're doing beautification projects all over the town. Uh, they're resurfacing a lot of our roads. Uh, so I, I would say that was a benefit. So when might civil disobedience be acceptable for Christians? And we'll read on into the recap to answer that question. Unfortunately, governments are run by imperfect people. Imperfect people do imperfect things. At times, these imperfect things will go against God's will. A challenge like this confronted uh, the apostles. The uh, authorities arrested the apostles and instructed them to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. But the apostles told the authorities, We must obey God rather than people. Now, this is not a loophole that allows us to disobey the government whenever it suits us. The Apostles' example is a reminder that we are to live in obedience to the government as long as that obedience doesn't cause us to sin against the will of God. Which is encouraging. And your, and your guys' quarterly, uh, that was on the very last page, the very last paragraph. I was glad to see that they put it a little more forward in the teachers. Uh, because I was going to bring it forward. Uh, don't uh, live in obedience to the government as long as the obedience doesn't cause us to sin against the will of God. So that's that's good for those who oppose God's command will bring judgment on them on themselves, which is usually you know the case. Uh, you do wrong, the the police put you in jail. Uh, there's a family that I know that uh, they don't like being conformist. They like living on the edge. The police visit their house on a regular basis. They also make the street up and down in front of the house. They go down the alley behind the house. And uh, what good is it doing these people? I mean, they, they just get watched like a hawk. Now, on the other hand, I try to stay within the guidelines of the law and uh, they don't bother me. I don't mind talking to them when they come by. Uh, it doesn't intimidate me to uh, talk to them because I feel like they're, they're people just like we are. The relationship of the Christian to government is a complex one. Uh, note that the scripture's admonition to respond to the government with obedience does not mean that believers cannot protest policies and actions of the government that dishonor God. Nor does it mean Christians must obey the government when doing so would be a sin against God. Therefore, the Christian's obedience to government is contingent on the expectation that governing authorities will operate within the boundaries of God's will. We all have to, to pray for that. Hopefully, uh, hopefully that's the case in most circumstances, but uh, here lately it doesn't seem to be. Uh, therefore, you must submit. Oh, excuse me. We're going to Romans 13, 5 through 7. Therefore, you must submit not only because of wrath, but also because of your conscience. 
and for this reason you pay taxes, since authorities are God's servants continually attending to these tasks. Pay your obligations to everyone, taxes you to those you owe taxes, tolls to those who you owe tolls, respect to those who you owe respect, and honor to those you owe honor. Now some people it's kind of hard to honor them because they don't act very honorable. So, uh, you know, that, that's, that's a difficult one. Our testimony shows up everywhere. So as much as possible, Christians should be model citizens. So we're looked at as uh, we're Christians and, and we need to set the example. We need to live the example. The, the biggest thing is that uh, you can see it in the news. They got these people that are so good, so long, and they make one mistake. What gets published? Everything all over the news is, well, this Christian did such and such. Well, that messed up all of his righteous living uh, done up to that point. And, uh, you know, that, that nullified everything that he's done up to that point. So, you know, we need to stay in Christ's service and, and, and do what we're supposed to as Christians. Live the life. We're instructed to submit, not only because of wrath, but also because of your conscience. Uh, what role does our conscience play regarding our citizenship? Hmm. Difficult decision there. Uh, I like to think that my citizenship is in the United States. I owe an allegiance to the United States. I salute the flag. I stand up for it. Uh, my conscience realizes that there are people who fought and died for that flag and to have the freedoms that we have now. So I guess uh, my conscience plays a very big importance in my citizenship. So how do we view these verses through the lens of our form of government? Hmm. Well, the government right now, especially in our state, seems to be demanding that you follow their mandates and their edicts, which are not necessarily laws. They're just somebody pushing their agenda on everybody. So compliance is, is still necessary to a point. But so far it hasn't crossed the line against God. So I guess we're still uh, following the Bible. So God uses the government to build us up. Road building and maintenance, water, sewage, police, emergency services, provisions for the poor, sick, elderly, are just a few of the ways that the government helps us. The government's ultimate role is to look after the nation as a whole and to make provisions that support the well-being and prosperity of its citizens. God uses our lives as a testimony of his faithful love and unselfish grace. That's where I was talking about we need to live the life, uh, live Christianity, show everybody where we are. The world is watching how he lives. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Non-believers may have used this title as in derision. It's apparent these people, uh, these believers were people whose lives they declared they uh, were living like Jesus. Sounds pretty cool to me. Kind of like uh, being called deplorable. What we've, uh, what was meant as a detrimental term, uh, we've kind of embraced as uh, we are the deplorables and we uh, have a say. We have a voice. So in, in uh, Paul's day, they were calling us Christians as a, as a bad term and we embraced it. So now that's, that's become a, a positive term in many cases. Some people believe, some people may never have read a Bible. So all they know about the character of God is what they learn by watching the lives of Christians. When we live good earthly, as good earthly citizens, people learn the faithful love and unselfish grace of God Almighty uh, we love and serve.
God uses the government for his purposes. God is working out his providential plan. From one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. Now that puts everything in perspective. God put one man down here to populate the world. So everybody is, came from Adam. <clears throat> and uh, he has chosen, God has chosen where these people live, how they, uh, what they will where the boundaries are and stuff like that. That's a pretty neat thought. We are sometimes so focused on our own lives and concerns, we forget what God is working all around us, even within the government. A king's heart is like channeled water in the Lord's hands. He directs it where he chooses. So, they go back to the, uh, the first of the verses. Most likely, utmost in Paul's mind, was the need not to hamper the spread of the gospel with senseless run-ins by the authorities. So all the time you have uh, going to the authorities, fighting the authorities, uh, being in their way, it could be time you could be serving the Lord in, uh, in Christian uh, service. Paul sought to help Christians view governing authorities as God-ordained servants to... In a, in a place to help them. So we're supposed to look at the authorities as a God ordained people that's there to uh, help us and to, to further us along. Now, in some cases, that's not always the case, but that's where the term vote comes in, you know. So uh, you want to be sure and get out there and vote. A lot of people fuss about it, but they don't go vote. So uh, the other side moves in because they're they're more committed to it. Satan is always a lot more committed to overtaking everything. Uh, okay, we'll go to Romans thirteen eight through ten. Do not owe anyone anything except love one another. For the the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments: Do not commit adultery. Do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and any other commandment are summed up by this commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. So it says here that it says it might seem that Paul changed the subject in verse 8 from the response of governing to loving one another, but we should read the verses again in context of how we respond to governing authorities. Every system is made better when fueled by love and no one has a greater obligation to love than the Christian. So how do these verses speak to our responsibility as Christian citizens? Well, as a Christian citizen, you need to live the life. You need to show out that, that you are Christian and, and show everybody the way to live. And uh, they will be attracted to that. And then in that response, then you can win them to Christ. So that is, that's what I look at it in, as anyway. What does loving others look like when it comes to politics? Well, here lately, it's kind of hard to see. Seems like there's a whole bunch of hate going on right now, being in a major league uh, election period. And... Uh, these people, they make up lies on on either side, make up lies about the other ones. And uh, it's up to us to disprove these lies and to look around them. So, and a lot of these are unfounded, uh, tr unfound truth, I guess you'd say. It's, uh, it's not really true until you can prove it. Politrix. Politics driven by love always seeks to do the right thing. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Love seeks to do what is right by our neighbors. And, and when in our political action is driven for, by love for God and the others, we will lose our selfish attitudes. So if we rule by love, you lose the selfish attitude, you know, like, what am I going to get out of this? Uh, you know, you, you have to look at it from a different point of view. 
when you go to to church and you and you start serving in the church the whole purpose is not for you to get better it's not so you'll be noticed it's so these other people will be helped or saved or you know whatever they need at the point in time that you are uh, issuing assistance our political actions must lift jesus up our votes must bring glory to god we do this when we care about all the things god carries cares about and i've been looking around here lately i've seen a new sign this this uh, political season in people's yards and they're saying vote biblically so we need to pray about who we vote for why we vote for what we're voting for pray about it and vote what god tells you to be to vote not what everybody else says so you could turn off the tv and turn off all the ads and god will tell you what's going on this also means that christians as christians we should never compromise our witness for a political agenda it is right to support politicians when they support god's plan at the same time we must be willing to call out those politicians when they are wrong. We must always serve God first. We've kind of gotten into a, a, an era of complacency. We don't challenge these people doing wrong uh, and haven't for years. And it's kind of become a habit. So now we have a president who's showing us what it's like to fight back in uh, the backlash is horrendous so you know we just need to beat this back down so the demons are not so prevalent the you can see that all of this time has uh, of no control has uh, backfired on a lot of situations and uh, we need to compress those situations back into the cracks and crevices where it came from so how can you love how can love overcome political division among christians well that's a hard question i'll i'll let you guys chew on that one and you can uh, email and text me that one if you need to in political discussions we are to honor christ in how we talk therefore we are to display common courtesy and the ability to disagree civilly now it seems like here lately we've lost a lot of civility on the other side because all i can do is scream and holler us down uh, there will never be a time when christians do not need to love one another jesus identified this mutual love as the defining characteristic by which others would know they were his disciples so if you're a disciple of christ you will need to love one another um, Paul made the same bold assertion in Galatians 5.14 that loving others fulfilled the whole law. James referred to the love of others as the royal law and indicated believers are doing well when they love their neighbors as themselves. Now your neighbors don't mean the ones next door necessarily. Uh, they're, they're neighbors, they're, they're defining neighbors as uh, the legislators stuff like that now neighbors could be the people next door and on your block that's uh, love love to a uh, love of self is understood in the positive sense of self-care not any a self-obsessed narcissistic sense just as people are careful to feed themselves to get adequate rest to take good care of themselves they should be careful uh, to hold their neighbors in high regard seeking to support and help them whenever possible Ah, oh, here it is. Neighbor, in our context, would would include the war ruling authorities ordained to keep the peace. So, there's a better definition than what I had on. So, we'll go to the last part here, and they're uh, they're guides for the week. Practice love. We're uh, in a season of elections, so politics is a common topic of discussion. At times, Christians may find themselves on opposite sides of an issue or debating with a candidate. Maintain love for others in your conversations and discussions. Plunge into God's word. The political issues we face today are not easy. Study scripture to see how it speaks to the issues. 
continually seek to be aligned with God and to do so uh, with love and humility. You know, it's everything's in the Bible. You dig far enough, you can find a advice on just about anything. So uh, participate. You are an active participant or you just do not want to complain from the sidelines. Oh, excuse me. Are you an active participant or do you just complain from the sidelines? It's important for Christians to influence the discourse in the public square of the political process. Get active and let your love for Christ be an influence. So we need to be part of the process. We need to show that we're, we're in there. Uh, a lot of times, if you'll notice in the newscasts, they don't show the positive side of things. They, they don't show that we stepped up and, and challenged something. They always show it on the opposite side, the negatives. Uh, <clears throat> the last thing, and to wrap it up, from my time on the school board to the present time, I have learned one important life lesson. We can disagree without being disagreeable. We may lose sometimes, but don't fret. God wins in the end. And there's a major league plus. We've all, uh, a lot of us have already read the back of the book and God wins. So there's no, there's no issue there because we know God wins in the end. So we all need to focus on the stuff at the end of the tunnel and uh, not where we are currently. So we need to uh, stop and pray. We want to pray for our legislators, our lawmakers, we need to pray for the president and uh, his decisions. Uh, so we'll go to the Lord in prayer and, uh, and make that request. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lovely day that you've given us to come to your house to worship you, to praise you. And we thank you for your sacrifices. Lord, we want to lift up all of our legislators uh, to make good and whole decisions. We need to lift up the president, Lord, that, that he's making the, the proper decisions and guiding the country in the correct manner. Lord, we want to thank you uh, for these current times, uh, for our protection. We want to uh, pray for this quarantine as we go through it, that, that we could be lifted, that we could get back to normal life. Lord, we know this is hurting a lot of people putting them out of business, bankrupting them. Uh, we, need these, uh, we need this system to be reinstated. Help us as we go through this and help us as we go back to the churches. Help us to, to be uh, prosperous in our churches. Help us to know the correct direction to drive the community. And help us as we, we uh, come into your presence. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for today. Uh, I hope I didn't step on too many toes. If I did, sorry, get steel toes. I have steel toes. So uh, if you need anything, just uh, you feel free to call, text, write, whatever else they do these days. Instagram, Snapchat. I don't know. I've got a Snapchat, but maybe I could figure out how to use it. So, well, it's good to see you guys. Thank you for coming.